When the Antonov AN-22 went down, the early reports told us it broke apart in flight. That alone was significant. But now, newly released footage shows us something we didn't have before. The actual sequence of that breakup unfolding in the air. And once you can see it, the conversation might change. This is William, and welcome to Black Box Analyst. The most important development since the initial reporting is the release of multiple video clips captured from different vantage points on the ground. There are three distinct camera angles that, when viewed together, allow us to establish sequence rather than speculation. And the first thing they confirm is that this was a true in-flight structural breakup, not an aircraft that struck the water and then disintegrated on impact. In the earliest clip, the aircraft is already in an unrecoverable state. What immediately stands out is the separation of the tail section, while the aircraft is still airborne. This isn't subtle damage. The empennage departs the fuselage cleanly enough that it becomes its own falling object, distinct from the main body of the airplane. From an investigative standpoint, that distinction matters. When major components separate before impact, they tell us where the failure occurred, not just how the wreckage ended up. As the footage continues, the relationship between the two pieces becomes clear. The tail section and the fuselage do not fall together. They do not remain aerodynamically coupled. They descend independently, each following its own trajectory. That alone eliminates the idea of a controlled descent or partial control scenario. There is no evidence of pitch recovery, no attempt to stabilize, and no sign that the aircraft was being flown after the breakup began. Once the separation occurred, the outcome was already decided. Another angle shows the main fuselage impacting the Uvodskoye Reservoir at high speed, producing a large, violent splash. This is important not because of the visual drama, but because of what it rules out. Water impacts can cause severe structural damage, especially at speed, but here the damage precedes the impact. The water didn't tear the airplane apart. The airplane arrived at the water already broken. That directly aligns with what witnesses initially reported on the day of the crash. Those accounts described large pieces falling from the aircraft while it was still in the air. Without video, investigators and analysts treat such reports cautiously. Human perception is imperfect, especially during sudden events. But now those reports are corroborated by imagery. One of the most sobering aspects of the footage is how quickly everything happens. From the moment the tail separates, there is no prolonged descent, no visible attempt at correction, and no window for crew coordination. This helps explain two key facts that initially raised questions. The absence of a distress call and the lack of any reported attempt to return or declare an emergency. The footage answers that without speculation. There simply wasn't time. It's worth pausing on that point because it often gets misunderstood. When people hear no mayday call, the assumption is sometimes delayed reaction or crew error. But in aviation investigations, the absence of a call often points in the opposite direction. It suggests a failure that progresses faster than human response can keep up with. This is one of those cases. Whatever initiated the breakup moved from first failure to catastrophic loss in seconds, not minutes. And once structural integrity is lost at that scale, survivability is no longer a meaningful concept. Large transports rely on the tail not just for control, but for stability. Remove it, and the aircraft is no longer an airplane in the aerodynamic sense it becomes a falling mass. The footage makes that reality unmistakably clear. What this new evidence gives us, above all, is certainty about sequence. The AN-22 did not strike the reservoir and then come apart. It came apart first, while airborne, and the reservoir was simply where the descent ended. That distinction narrows the investigation dramatically because it moves the focus away from impact dynamics and squarely onto the systems and structures that could fail in flight with such immediacy. And that leads naturally to the next question investigators ask once sequence is established. What kinds of failures can produce a tail separation this quickly, without warning, and without leaving time for a response? Once the sequence is clear, investigators don't rush to conclusions, they narrow the field, and the newly released footage does exactly that. A tail separation on an aircraft of this size is immediately catastrophic. The tail provides both stability and control, and without it, the aircraft cannot remain aerodynamically viable. This wasn't a developing emergency that gave the crew time to diagnose or manage a failure. It was a sudden transition from controlled flight to unrecoverable loss. That detail matters because it points toward failures that introduce extreme loads very quickly. 
Investigators therefore focus on systems capable of producing those loads. One area is flight control integrity. If a control surface behaves in a way the structure wasn't designed to tolerate, whether through incorrect assembly, loss of synchronization, or mechanical malfunction, aerodynamic forces can escalate faster than the airframe can absorb them. Structural elements in the tail and aft fuselage also come under close scrutiny, particularly where fatigue margins and repair quality intersect. The footage also reinforces what investigators are not seeing. There are no visual indicators of an external strike no explosion signatures, and no abrupt directional changes, consistent with hostile action. That aligns with official statements ruling out external interference, and supports the conclusion that this was an internal failure. The absence of radio calls fits the same pattern. When failures progress this quickly, crews don't fail to communicate, they simply don't have time. By the moment the loss of control becomes apparent, the aircraft is already beyond recovery. What the footage does not do is identify the initiating failure. It doesn't tell us which component failed first, or why. What it does provide is investigative focus. It defines the boundaries of the problem, and allows irrelevant theories to fall away. With that clarity, attention naturally shifts to the conditions under which this aircraft was returned to flight. The AN-22 was not flying a routine transport mission. It was conducting a post-maintenance test flight. That fact alone makes maintenance context relevant, but recent reporting gives that context new weight. The facility responsible for the work, the 308th Aircraft Repair Plant in Ivanovo, has been facing severe financial distress for months. Workers reportedly went unpaid, debts accumulated into the millions, and even basic utilities were at risk of being shut off. Financial trouble does not automatically equate to technical failure. But in aviation maintenance, it raises legitimate questions about conditions on the shop floor. Skilled labor depends on stability. Quality control depends on time, oversight, and redundancy. When those elements are under strain, the margin for error narrows, especially on aging aircraft where tolerances are already tight. What makes this situation more consequential is the plant's strategic role. It is reportedly the only facility in Russia capable of servicing certain Antonov transport types, including the AN-22. It also supports large portions of the AN-26 and AN-72 fleets. They reflect a bottleneck in the entire maintenance ecosystem for Soviet-designed transport aircraft. There's also a legal and organizational layer to this story. A court ruling earlier this year ordered the plant to repay millions over a disputed repair contract. That suggests financial stress was not sudden or unforeseen. It had been building, and it existed within a system that was already under geopolitical and logistical pressure. Unconfirmed reporting has pointed toward potential issues involving flight control system, assembly, or repair. It's important to be careful here. These are not findings. They are early signals of investigative interest, but when viewed alongside the failure sequence seen in the footage, they become relevant lines of inquiry rather than idle speculation. All of this fits into a broader pattern affecting Russian aviation since the start of the war. Access to navigation databases has been restricted. Crews reportedly rely on paper charts. Software substitutes have been inconsistent. Even pre-flight planning processes have been simplified out of necessity. None of these factors cause an aircraft to break apart by themselves, but together, they describe an operating environment where resilience is steadily eroded. The loss itself goes beyond the airframe. Along with it, an experienced crew was lost people whose knowledge cannot be replaced quickly, if at all. In aviation, experience isn't just logged in hours. It's embedded in judgment, pattern recognition, and instinct, especially during test flights. Taken together, the footage and the repair context sharpen a question that was already present after the initial crash, but can now be asked more directly. Was this aircraft flying because it met an acceptable safety standard, or because operational necessity left no better option? That question is not an accusation. It's the kind of question accident investigators ask precisely because they're trying to prevent the next one. And as more wreckage is recovered and analyzed, the answers will come not from speculation, but from metal, measurements, and methodical work. For now, what the new footage gives us is clarity. Not about cause, but about reality. The AN-22 did not fail slowly. It did not give warning, and it did not fail in isolation. Those are the facts that will shape everything that follows. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video.